Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for your interest and time and for joining us in this session to discuss the topic of leveraging food sustainability information to improve food supply and demand across the food systems. Uh, I'm Denise Westerhout and I am the Asian Markets Senior Expert at WF International. My key role is to, my key role responsibility is to deliver strategic advice to conservation focused initiative across Asia. And this includes driving supply chain sustainability and traceability, as well as influencing behavior change in driving sustainable consumption. Um, the last, the, the, the last few years, I've, I've been piloting the behavior change expertise within WWF and recently published the Save Nature Please Framework and Report for Behavior Change. In 2017, the journal Current Biology published an entry by Michael Shatlin, PhD of Columbia University and his team. Um, the research con conducted showed that many of our decisions take place at a point where the brain feels as though it has generated enough of information or when a critical level of information has been accumulated. Now, reaching this threshold is really important because although the brain does not use all of the information available, it uses as much as necessary to make a speedy yet accurate decision. Hence, the more we learn, the better we will be at making decisions. With that in mind, the session today aims to share insights on communicating food sustainability for shaping both supply and demand across consumer markets. On one hand, we will discuss the challenges of influencing consumer food choices and how labeling and other information tools can influence demand. This session will also address the worrying state of play um, regarding the supply of sustainable products, as well as the need for agri-food business to significantly step up their efforts to transition to a more sustainable food system and the achievement of the SDGs. On the other hand, business representatives will share the experiences of integrating product sustainability information onto their corporate procurement, marketing, and sales strategies, which also includes barriers and enablers towards developing a more sustainable overall product portfolio. And finally, the session will address the needs for complementary actions in enabling environments, um, such as public policies and other initiatives that can stimulate both the supply and demand of sustainable foods. We've got together quite a quite a impressive set of speakers and panelists. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to you our first speaker, Joshua Bishop. He is currently the conservation economist at WF Australia. Previously, he has published numerous articles and co-authored or edited six books, including a landmark UN study of the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, and was the technical editor of the National Capital Natural <coughs> Capital. Josh. I'll pass the screen over to you to set the scene regarding sustainability in the current food systems. Thanks, Denise. I hope everybody can hear me. And good evening from Sydney, Australia. Uh, as Denise said, I'm Josh Bishop. I'm a conservation economist in WWF Australia, and I'd like to give a, a brief overview of a project that we recently concluded. Um, before I do that, I'm going to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, and I uh, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge my co-authors um, from the University of Sydney, as well as uh, other partners and sponsors in this project. And you see the, the title of the project and the logos of the partners there on the screen. Um, and you also see the cover page of the, the final report, which we um, concluded last May. Um, the overall objective of the project was to do document best practices in communicating food sustainability credentials to consumers uh, with an emphasis on eco-labels. And uh, that included a, a literature review, which is the basis of my presentation, as well as some case studies uh, carried out by GlobeScan of uh, food uh, businesses and labeling organizations. Quick outline of uh, the report and indeed of this presentation. We'll look at some uh, key definitions, uh, put consumer choice in the context of food system transformation, unpack some of the drivers of consumer food choices, highlight evolving dietary preferences, look at uh, different sources of information that consumers rely on when choosing food, 
focus on the, uh, the use of labeling and the impacts of labeling on consumer choice, uh, including some of the challenges of labeling. Um, briefly uh, review some complementary behavioral interventions, uh, and then finally highlight a, a few selected recommendations. Next slide, please. So we start with some definitions. Um, what do we mean by sustainable food consumption? Um, and as you can see on the left, the focus is both environmental and social, and it's important to acknowledge that sustainability ca captures uh, all of both of those dimensions and, and others as well, but those are the, the two we focused on. And I also want to highlight that we did not attempt to influence, or sorry, to assess the truthfulness of food sustainability claims made on labels or elsewhere. That would have required a completely separate uh, uh, research project on actual food production practices, processing and distribution is far beyond the scope of this report. However, we do provide guidance throughout on um, sources of uh, information about the credibility of uh, labels and sustainability claims. Um, men, a number of other key definitions are provided on what do we mean by consumers, communication, information, animal uh, source foods, eco labels, and so on, all available in the report. Next slide. So shifting consumer behavior is obviously part of a, a much larger agenda for sustainable food systems transformation. Um, we know that food systems deliver reliable access to diverse and tasty food for billions of people uh, at relatively modest costs. But, and there are big buts, uh, malnutrition persists uh, worldwide. One in nine people today go hungry. One in three are overweight or obese. Uh, the costs and benefits of uh, food systems are not all counted uh, by markets, nor are they shared equitably in society. Food accounts for uh, some 25 to 33 percent of greenhouse gas emissions and rising. Uh, agriculture is the main driver of deforestation and biodiversity loss on land, uses two thirds of all fresh water. Fishing and aquaculture are the main drivers of biodiversity decline in marine ecosystems. Uh, and all of this is amplified by food waste. Uh, roughly 17% of all food produced globally for human consumption is not consumed by people. Um, and that waste is concentrated in high income households. We also know that most wasted food goes to landfill where it results in uh, additional methane emissions contributing to climate change. So lots of uh, sustainability challenges in the food system. And it's increasingly clear that without dietary change, it may be impossible to feed everyone and stay within planetary boundaries. Uh, these challenges are not new, of course, but they're getting more attention today partly due to the disruptions of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and also the ongoing war in Ukraine, but also on the flip side, as a result of the UN um, Food System Summit that was held uh, almost exactly a year ago. And those summit outcomes are now feeding into both the Climate COP and the, the Biodiversity COP uh, being held later this year and are being translated into action uh, at many different levels. Um, I think I'll just add here that there's probably a lot more promising um, action on the supply side. Um, I think there's a, a gap on the demand side and uh, potential to uh, do much more. Next slide. So when we look at consumer behavior and consumer food choice, um, we need to understand what drives uh, people's decisions in, in when they're choosing food. And as you can see from this uh, table from Chen and Antonelli, there are many, many different drivers of consumer food choices, ranging from physical attributes, such as the taste of uh, ingredients, to uh, individual differences between people, as well as uh, many wider social and, and economic influences. Some of these influences are, are conscious, many are not conscious or not uh, immediately apparent, and they all matter. Um, for example, social norms or um, the physical environment uh, in which food choices are made. That could be a market, a cafeteria, or even at home, the way food is presented 
um, the the accessibility of different food items, say in a in a cafeteria, can influence the choices that people make. Uh, and as we all know, what it looks like uh, has a huge difference as well. Next slide. When we ask people uh, directly what drives their food choices, they tend to emphasize just a few key attributes. Uh, consumers in the United States, for example, uh, rank the taste of food at the top, followed by price or affordability, health or healthfulness or nutrition, and convenience uh, or perhaps availability. Um, these are fairly consistent rankings uh, in across other countries as well, from what we see in the literature. Um, and we also see uh, here and elsewhere that environmental and social impacts, in other words, sustainability, um, they're important, um, but they rank lower in consumers' minds. And the importance of environmental sustainability in particular has not changed much uh, in recent years, at least in the US. Next slide. At the same time, we can see the emergence of some new dietary preferences in many countries, including the rise of organic food, um, which uh, emerged over 100 years ago now, um, and much more recently, the growing interest in plant-rich diets, vegetarian, vegan, uh, and, and variations of that, pescatarian, flexitarian, etc., as well as uh, interest and, and preference for some people call free from foods, free from gluten, free, free from GMOs and, and so on. And there's also interest in localism. Um, that people look for foods that have been produced near where they, they consume them um, in part because of uh, a sense that this is more sustainable or that they have uh, better access to uh, information about uh, production um, practices. And alongside all these dietary preferences, we see the rise of online food shopping and delivery. So where do consumers learn about these different options? Next slide. Uh, again, some data from the United States. Um, and, and I should point out here that a lot of the data in this report and indeed the, the information that's available in the literature comes from North America and Europe or the global North uh, generally. So that's a gap uh, in the information we have available. But in this case, um, you can see that consumers get their information about food from many, many different sources. Um, and labels are just one of uh, the different sources of information that consumers rely on. And we need to bear that in mind when thinking about how to influence consumer choice. What cha information channels uh, can we use? Next slide. Cutting to the chase, um, looking specifically at labels uh, on food, whether those are sustainability labels, eco labels, nutritional labels, health labels. Um, the literature generally suggests that there is a measurable, uh, statistically significant and positive influence on consumer choice. Um, labels and uh, similar guidelines increase the accuracy of selection of environmentally friendly foods. Um, labels that are well-designed convey something that is meaningful to consumers, that can be understood quickly. Um, and uh, as an economist, I'm particularly interested in the fact that consumers uh, claim that they're willing to pay more for labeled products. Uh, and there's an example there on the slide of a relatively large um, uh, study that ought to unpack that particular point. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the, the data that we relied on privileging um, reviews and, and meta-analyses. Um, and you can see some of the statistics of uh, where, we, we, where we drew these conclusions. Um, notable here is the fact that there are relatively few uh, real life tests of labels and information. Most of this data, as I said earlier, comes from consumers in the global north. Most data is based on uh, online surveys with hypothetical scenarios. And there are really only a handful of in-store experiments described in the literature. Um, these also show positive but modest impacts from labeling. Um, our suspicion is that there's a lot more information out there um, in industry, but it's commercially uh, in confidence. It's proprietary and not uh, readily available in, in the scientific literature. Next slide. There are a number of challenges with eco-labeling. Um, 
consumer awareness of and trust in labels doesn't always align with their behavior. Um, some consumers respond more than others um, and labels may be misinterpreted. Um, consumers will look at the, uh, a label describing the, the, the sustainability of the packaging uh, of a food product and assume that the uh, ingredients on the inside are also sustainable just on that basis. Lessons from experience with health and nutritional labels, really quite similar. Um, that uh, um, there are positive impacts, but they are modest, uh, it, it must be said. Next slide. The, um, I suppose some of the, the challenges associated with labeling have led people to look for complementary interventions, other ways of influencing consumers, and in particular, uh, drawing on uh, consumer psychology and behavioral science to um, uh, try to address some of the non-rational or less conscious motivations for food choices. Um, so presenting information with a motivational goal, emphasizing social norms, building communities and peer pressure, providing direct access to experts, giving out product samples. All of these are attempts to change the, the psychology uh, of um, food choices. Um, and the, the literature suggests that food choices are especially responsive to what are called choice architecture interventions. That is to say, how you present a food item. I mentioned before, in a cafeteria, putting the plant-based option at the front and the, the animal-based uh, product at the back, something as simple as that will lead uh, a few more people to choose the plant-based option or putting the plant-based option at the top of the menu in a restaurant and uh, the meat uh, or animal-based um, protein options uh, further down at the sides of the menu where they're less uh, prominent. There are a number of other interventions which we review in the report. Um, next slide, please. So what, what we find with all of these behavioral interventions is a bit like labels. They do make a difference if, if they're well-designed and implemented. Uh, they can change decision-making at the margin. But really, if we want the best possible outcomes, we need to combine multiple communication methods uh, into a, a package. And here's an example of a, an integrated approach that combined behavioral nudges or the prominence with which plant-based um, offerings were, were presented to consumers along with in-store promotions and social media and uh, QR codes linking to videos and, and so on and so on. If, if you combine uh, multiple strategies alongside the label, you can get a, a much better impact. Next slide. A few key recommendations, um, and these are just uh, a handful of the, those provided in the report. Uh, obviously, sustainability communications about food need to be science-based. They need to be intelligible, visible, credible, holistic, and comparable across products and diets. And the, the UNEP has their 2017 principles or guidelines for uh, communicating food sustainability, which are, are a good starting point. As I mentioned before, um, eco-labels can't be seen as an isolated strategy, but need to be part of integrated uh, uh, communications tailored to their market and their audience. Um, we, we should probably learn more than we have from that segment of the consumer market who do respond, who do rely on eco-labels. How are they different and how do we use their experience and their motivation to strengthen social norms around food sustainability? There's a lot governments need to do. I won't uh, read these out, um, but there's also a lot that businesses need to do or could do more of, and that is collaborate uh, and coordinate so that they are um, presenting similar or comparable messages um, and uh, sharing more of their data on what works and what doesn't work. Because of course they spend billions every year on marketing food products. Um, they could spend billions on marketing sustainable food products um, and sharing the, the, the results of that. I think that would go a long way to uh, accelerate progress. Next slide and final one. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. Uh, I look forward to the discussion. That's all for me. Thank you, Josh, as always. Very insightful, and I learn something every time I have a conversation with you. So thank you very much for that. Now, I forgot to mention earlier that if you do have any questions or comments, please feel free to drop them, drop them in the chat box, and we will try to get them during the question and answer session later after the panel discussion. 
Don't be shy. Uh, we're hoping to get lots of um, encouragement and questions from you so that we can move the discussion along. Now, without, without taking up too much of anyone's time, I would like to introduce our next speaker, who is from the World Benchmarking Alliance, WBA. WBA was established in 2018 to develop transformative benchmarks that will compare companies' performance on the SDGs. Uh, these benchmarks are usually backed by the best available science materials while leveraging existing platforms, net, norms, and standards. It's really created a change in the way business has business impact is measured and has boosted encouragement and motivation across the sector for um, greater commitments towards sustainable sustainable um, policies in general. So now, without further ado, I see Victoria's ready. I'm pleased to pass the screen over to WBA's Food and Agriculture Transformation Lead, Victoria Bourbon de Palm. Victoria, over to you. Thank you very much, Denise. It's a great pleasure to be here and, uh, and contribute to this important discussion. Uh, in my presentation, I will um, try to focus and zoom out a bit on, uh, on, on, on the broader food systems topics that are there and, uh, and focus, of course, on, on the assessment that we made on the private sector. Um, on the next slide, uh, you will see, as Denise already set out, that we are uh, in the business of really looking at the private sector's contribution to the sustainable development goals. I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, walk you through that in the next couple of slides. So moving on, you will see that uh, we have translated the SDGs into different systemic changes that need to happen. So obviously we, uh, we have a food and agriculture system that we'll focus on, which integrates uh, all the social elements like respecting human rights, uh, providing decent work. But of course, also the link with the financial industry and the financial systems is very important uh, as a driver of companies' performances. Uh, so I'm leading the food and agriculture team and on the next slide, uh, I will set out to you how that assessment looks like. So how we have translated food systems analysis. Um, if you would generalize and, and bring it down to maybe three thematic main themes, uh, it's really about environment, social inclusion and nutrition. Um, and as you will see in, in, in my upcoming presentation, it's really a complex set of topics and it's, and it's a lot to take in, I guess, for consumers to make those decisions. Uh, but ideally, of course, we, we see labeling a lot centered around nutrition, but I really like the discussion today that is focusing more broadly about sustainable choices. And hopefully through the slides I'm presenting here today, you see what kind of topics are relevant and how we could hopefully influence and encourage consumers to make the right choices. So standards, corporate reporting frameworks, there's a lot happening in this space to create global consensus. And we really applaud that and take all of that in in the food and agriculture benchmark assessment. So as an organization, we don't tend to set metrics. We don't tend to set the benchmark, but look at where there is uh, consensus and really uh, hopefully also science-based targets. And I'd also like to point out that there's, of course, many other great uh, benchmark and index uh, initiatives that have even a more deeper focus on specific topics. Of course, you are uh, well aware of the Access to Nutrition uh, initiative with its global index, but there's also the Force 500, uh, the FAIR uh, benchmark around animal protein and, and more relevant topics. So really, there's a lot of knowledge out there which broadly looks at companies and we do that as well we look at the company in its entirety and not at individual product uh, products in the portfolio which of course consumers have to deal with in their choices so moving moving along you will uh, see that uh, in our assessment we have looked at really the entire value chain um, so it's important also to realize that a lot of these topics a lot of the sustainability um, issues that we try to solve have to be dealt with in other parts of the value chain so really that collaboration between value chain partners is important and of course that's why uh, the global community has brought together all of these players in the un food systems summit last year which has a strong uh, following up in uh, in the years to come. So in total, we looked at 350 companies uh, and across these thematic areas uh, that I've set out, environment, nutrition, and social inclusion. And a fine which all have sort of a 30% weighing for a total score. Um, and the final 10% comes from general governance and strategy indicators, really looking at, um, at where a company is starting from, what are their sustainability 
um, standards and, uh, and also uh, key performance indicators. So moving on to the findings, uh, and you can skip to the to the next slide immediately. Um, I'd like to share just a short brief overview. You can find all of this information online. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm walking through these slides uh, quickly. On the left-hand side, you see the top 10 uh, of the benchmark uh, that has been published last year alongside the UN Food Systems Summit. What we were really happy to see is that there's diff uh, different companies from the entire value chain, except uh, retailers and food service providers. And I think that is really important to note that that is, of course, a group of companies that are very closely uh, related to consumers and consumer choices. And, and Josh has really set this out already brilliantly in, in the uh, um, past presentation, also noting that placement of products, but also placement of products on menus has such a big impact on what a consumer will ultimately choose. So the fact that these companies are not yet performing as higher as other peers uh, really demonstrates that that segment uh, has, um, that there's a lot to be done and, and a lot of, of, of uh, gain to be made um, to helping consumers make better choices. Moving on to other findings that I'd like to share uh, is one of the more optimistic ones is that really the vast amount um, <clears throat> of companies has a sustainability target. Uh, but if you trickle that down to, to how companies are motivated, I, I was speaking about these KPIs and remuneration policies, there is a lot, uh, lot that still could be made to ensure that it's not just a nice to have for companies, but it's really a part of their business model. But this is really just the back end, uh, which of course consumers uh, don't see if, if, if they are in, in the shops, but gives you an idea about where companies are coming from. On to the next slide, where we um, where I've brought uh, forward uh, a few of the environmental findings. Of course, we're all aware about greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the elimination of deforestation, uh, the importance also of regenerative agriculture, and also the reduction of food loss and waste. These are all topics, and many of these, especially deforestation and regenerative agriculture, uh, which consumers are are <clears throat> are increasingly becoming aware of but that is happening elsewhere in the value chain and it's quite it, there's of, of course you can't put everything on a label and you can't and and certifications are also have its limitations so it's really difficult to how to convey these messages to consumers and how will they be able to differentiate and a lot of companies are working towards regenerative agriculture to ensuring that we keep health healthy soils for uh, the next generations to come. But how are you involving your customers in, uh, into ensuring that they make uh, that they come along on these choices? I guess really building that bridge between the farm and the consumers is, is an important one to, to tell the story of farmers by, uh, by the companies that are more in touch with consumers. Uh, and this, this goes for retailers as well. There's really a bridge to be made in, in the value chain. Moving on, a next uh, area that we've looked at, which is social inclusion. This is, I, I guess, the, the area which um, has the most knowledge, I think, by consumers uh, can, <clears throat> and, and labels around fair trade and, 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 and the fair price for, for farmers, for their, co for their, um, for their commodities. So the, this, it, but it's still something area of development um, and import, very important to, to consumers. Uh, um, and also something uh, very relevant to consider. Again, all of these findings are uh, can be uh, you can look at them in more detail on on our website. I'd like to go on to the final uh, main, main finding uh, that we have had in the benchmark, which is of course around nutrition. And uh, and here uh, I'd like to dive a bit more deeper because it also also is so relevant for our discussion today. So really, providing clear and adequate nutrition information is 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 paramount. And, and there's so much debate about what, what is healthy, what is not, um, and, uh, and, and that it constitutes of much more uh, also regarding a lifestyle and the diet. Um, but the influence of, of, of these companies is, of course, mainly on, on the product uh, that they're selling and, uh, and, and how it is built up. So there is a very clear um, <clears throat> understanding of, of, of the ingredients we would like to see less of uh, the reduction of say, salt, saturated fats, uh, uh, and sugar. Um, so a, a, an overall 
overall decline in highly processed foods. And I think there's also a really big difference in products that are consumed daily or products that are um, just meant for for more celebratory or, or one-off occasions. But it's, it's very crucial that marketing and labeling is, is put out. And we see that, that there is a really big gap, especially in retailers and restaurants and serve, food service providers. If it, for example, comes to responsible marketing, we see that many of these companies don't uh, are promoting and, and uh, having price reductions on unhealthy products uh, and not on the healthy products. Which, of course, especially in the in the environment we are today, with with high rising food prices and inflation soaring, is really important that there is a, um, that it's incentivized also through pricing and through promotions that healthy choices are the more economic ones. And then uh, I have just one final slide um, with uh, um, with some general general takeaways. Of course, there's a big need for harmony. Organization. And really, it's great to see companies trying to come to together uh, to unify front of pack labels. There's to to, to help uh, consumers navigate better. Uh, of course, the policy angle in this is very important as well. Also, to come to a more unified idea about what is healthy and, and what can what what kind of health claims can you make. And just one um, or side note I'd like to pull out is around blue foods. It's um, it's it's broader than just seafood. It's really Really, uh, foods that come from from the oceans or from aquaculture, uh, which I think um, is is less prominent in our food systems debate. It's a, a very highly nutritious products product. It provides livelihood from over eight hundred million uh, people, often in in a small scale producer setting. And let's not forget, it has a lower environmental footprint than many of its animal protein peers. Uh, uh, I'm of course mostly not speaking about the the, the the, the big um, fish and like the salmon, salmons and, and the tunas, but the diversification of blue foods would also really enrich uh, the choices that consumers have in more cheaper options, more healthy options, and more environmentally sustainable options. So that just is a specific example I would like to share. And um, that's the conclusion of, the, of my presentation. I'm looking forward to the discussion ahead. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, before we continue, you'll see that on the side of your chat box, a little poll has popped up. We've got three questions to ask you. Sorry, give me a moment here. Um, we've got three questions to ask you. They're very short ones, but uh, we'd like you all to participate freely in this poll. First, we'd like to know what you perceive to be the biggest challenge to leverage product sustainability information for sustainable food consumption. We'd also like to know which one of the following um, provided there um, is most critical to increase the effectiveness and credibility of sustainability information on food products. And finally, we'd like to know what your perception is, uh, what you think is the biggest challenge to leverage product sustainability information for sustainable food consumption. So a lot of it has to do with challenge, but um, I will discuss some of the solutions later. And once you're done, we will provide a synthesis or a summary of the results later in the session after the Q&A. Now, while you're responding to that, I'd like to summarize a couple of points that stood out really um, clearly for me during Josh and Victoria's presentation. So the first one is, Josh, you shared some really jarring data on the extent of hunger, obesity, and food loss across the globe, be it from the global north. Um, but what's clear from your presentation is the role of information on food labeling. It can obviously play a role in influencing segments of the community. There's, a, there's no silver bullet here, obviously. We need to identify who we want to change and how we're going to change them. And the second is that we need to be realistic about who, what, where, and how we can influence at any given instance. So what stood out also for me was the fact when you discussed choice architecture. When you mentioned your presentation, it, it is indeed one of the most common and successful behavioral science interventions employed that has influenced consumer choices. I mean, we are faced with it every day. For example, when you go into Starbucks or you go into McDonald's, the super size idea behind it is a little bit more for a lot more. Um, again, that's all about choice architecture. Nonetheless, uh, I think to summarize, what is what more is needed is really to address how we can cross over the chasm that is the value action gap for consumers. And from Victoria's presentation, it's fascinating that WBA looks at the whole company, not just the pro just one product stream. It's really welcome. And I listened with interest at the data that you have on hand to illustrate the journey that's left for companies and, and really to help us achieve 
improve sustainability across the board. Uh, of particular value, I think, is the complementary role that the environment, social and nutrition all play in this benchmark. We rarely see them labeled together, and, and this is a very nice change. The unification of labeling really is an interesting topic, but I think it's, it surely does deserve more thought and deeper discussion. Um, I hope in the meantime, you have all been able to respond to the polls and um, are satisfied with the responses that you've given. We are going to move on to the next session, which is um, a panel session. And we are, we're very happy to be able to be joined by five esteemed panelists who are invited to share their perspectives on two questions posed to them. So please do join me in welcoming the first panelist, Matthew John. Matthew John is the Managing Director at Last Forest and Co-Founder and Director of Keystone Foundation. Next up is Agnes Martin. Um, health and Diet Advocacy Director at Danone. Third is Kamana Kafla, Founder and CEO at Kamana Agriculture, Agriculture Solution and Research Centre, Private Limited, as well as the Agriculture Coordinator at Seva Nepal. Could you please mute your mics? Thank you. Um, second last, the fourth member uh, on our panel is Paul Holmbeck. He's a board member of the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements. Paul joins us with over 20 years of experience in organic Denmark. And last but not least, we, we have Dr. Michael Clark, a researcher at Oxford University. Um, I would like each panelist to share their views about what they see as the biggest challenge to leverage product sustainability information for more sustainable food consumption. Um, hi, I'm Matthew. Um, Denise, can I go ahead and share? Yes, please go ahead. Um, I will post the question again in the chat box so everyone has a reference. Go ahead, Matthew, you've got four minutes. Yeah. So I mean, when I was looking at this question that, you know, what is the, the biggest challenge to leverage uh, product sustainability information? And I was thinking of it primarily from an Indian point of view. And um, I see that, you know, some of the biggest challenges that come in a region, in a country like India, is just that the, the population of this country is so huge. And when we talk about information going out, how do you address this kind of information to such a diverse population? A population that is um, so diverse in terms of its culture, um, so diverse in terms of language. And, and I think most importantly, when we talk of language, is just the ability for people to, to read and write. And, and I see that this information is so focused on, an, on the language of English. And I was just wondering this morning, who does this, this information address? And in my country, I think just two, two, two factors play such an important role. One is price. And, and the second one is just compliance with statutory regulations. And I think that forms the core of for, for most customers. And, and to go beyond that, to start looking at labels, whether it is organic. And organic is the, is the one label which is most common around this country, just because the, the state is involved as an actor in, the, in this process. But if you take any other label, there is and the, the second largest label that I would, I would uh, think about is the fair trade label. And there is such a negligible amount of information out there. Forget about, forget about the, the officials or the state officials that are part of this process. And they have, they have such a limited understanding. So for me, trying to put this together and extrapolating it even to the Asian region, poses such a great challenge where there is language diversity just moves from country to country and how we are able to put this together and send it out to the to the customers the other thing that i was i was looking about uh, looking at is that in the global north most of the products most of the food is packaged 
So whether it is even fruits and vegetables or meat and fish, all of it is packaged. And you come to a country like India, where 99% of these items are not packaged at all. And a lot of it is just based on trust. Because you go to an area, to a market, and you are able to purchase this. And that trust forms the underlying factor. And so, and so it's, a, it's a very interesting, though we've had a, a fabulous uh, two presentations. Um, constantly, these questions will continue to, to, to challenge us in a country like India and taking it forward into an entire region like Asia. And so that would remain a very interesting um, discussion to have. Yeah. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Matthew. It's fascinating, right, where India has officially 22 languages, but hundreds over that's not official. So yes, it's, it's a huge challenge. Good luck with that one. Yeah. Um, moving on, we'll move to Agnes, who is from Danone. Agnes, so I'll repeat the question for you. What is the biggest challenge to leverage product sustainability information for more sustainable food consumption? So thank you, Denise, for this uh, invitation to take part of this panel, which is very, very interesting. So what we know as manufacturers is that uh, consumers are really craving for uh, transparency, but for sure they are very confused with uh, so many labels they have on the package. And, but the good news is that in Europe, where I will uh, I have uh, the most of experience, we can now learn a lot from uh, environmental, from uh, sorry, nutritional labeling that we have seen uh, happening in different European countries. And uh, the biggest challenge I really see is about harmonization. <clears throat> and we see the same kind of question happening here now in, in uh, Europe for uh, environmental labeling. Uh, during the last two years, we have seen many uh, new uh, labels, which are the global label happening on the market. And uh, we can see that uh, they are very different in terms of methodology, but in terms of form of expression. And we know that if consumers um, have to be able to, con to compare products between them, they need to get comparable schemes uh, in terms of, of labeling. So clearly, we need to get some policies or regulation whether at national or even regional level, in order to ensure uh, that we have this kind of harmonization. And I will just take an, uh, some example. Regarding the methodology uh, to calculate the global impact in terms of environment of uh, food products, of course, we can use a uh, life cycle analysis approach, which is used for other types of goods. But clearly, we see that for agricultural products, we need some adjustments because the classical LCA does not take into account the positive externalities provided by sustainable production systems. And it's, I think it's very crucial because if we use LCA, classical LCA, then uh, products coming from intensive production comes with a better score than organic ones, an example. And I think we can dig into that with uh, the presentation for uh, EIOFM. Uh, same question about data. Uh, we need very good data in order to be sure that the the, the the score we we calculate is uh, is relevant and uh, having good quality data might be a big challenge for a small and uh, small enterprise so it means that then once government must take the lead to deliver some uh, reliable generic data so this is about uh, harmonization but when we comes to consumer we also know that uh, from the experience on nutritional labeling that if we want to introduce a new label on the on the on the market we need to accompany consumers in terms of increasing their awareness for this kind of information and be sure that governments are organizing big uh, campaign of communication to the general public in order to really capture that. And um, we, for environmental labeling specifically, I think we also have, we have seen during the, the work we have been done during the last two years that having just one single score would be not enough because people have quite uh, some difficulty to understand what it means, global environmental impact. They are more familiar with biodiversity, pesticides, uh, natural resources, climate change, and it means that we might probably deliver additional information than just a global score. And finally, the last <coughs> challenge I see is really about be sure that what we deliver in terms of labeling will, will be uh, understood and will have a positive impact on consumer behavior. And that mean, means that we need to proceed to a costly consumer trials to measure uh, the in real condition. I mean, to measure to measure the real impact and to avoid uh, unintended consequences. 
And it's particularly important for people with low educational level, because as we said before, for these people, we need to uh, to find some very simple solution in terms of form of expression that does not require a, a lot of uh, education. Thank you. Fantastic. You're right. It, it does cost quite a bit to run these trials and to find exact intervention that gives us the impact that we want. Um, thank you so much, Agnes. Kamana, now it's your turn to help us uh, to help us with sharing some of your perspectives on the question. Thank you so much, Denise. Hello, everyone. I am Kamna Kafle and I am from Nepal. Moreover, I would like to uh, give some of the, uh, my points regarding the challenge. Uh, so I have a list down some of the particular things and I will be discussing on that basis. So first and foremost, uh, there are diversified of the consumers who are uh, participating in the sustainable food consumption. So the diversity uh, of the consumers are one of the challenges so that we can not tackle to them and there is level of interest of the consumer so people are uh, interested on uh, many more things just like safety food policy i think so they, they are not much more aware about the products and everything here in nepal there is weak regulation uh, of the government authority they have uh, prepared the laws and policy but they are not implement uh, really well so the regulatory mechanism of uh, organizational setup is one of the challenges for uh, for the consumers here in nepal uh, so uh, uh, there is the poor knowledge regarding the problem information. So uh, if they are uh, packaged and they have uh, come from the different authorities source, uh, they haven't got any knowledge or they are uh, randomly taking the date expiry products. And uh, that is the main challenge, I think, for the consumers. Uh, so uh, uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Kamala. Um, Paul, you're up next. Why don't you share some of your thoughts about this, having the vast experience you've had with the organic sector? Sure. Yeah, thanks. And thank you for all the interesting uh, remarks already. Um, I think uh, besides Victoria's very good point that we one problem is that we have too few producers, too few companies that are actually delivering real results is one problem. Another is um, that we need some real game changers in the market to level the playing field price wise between sustainable and non sustainable products. This would require green fee systems, uh, redirecting subsidy programs so that we have a more level playing field price wise. Um, but I think, you know, the real challenge specifically on the topic here today is to find simple ways of communicating on um, broad sustainability benefits and i think you know planet score is one option i think uh, organic certification also delivers on a whole range of sustainability efforts and i think we need models for both the global north and the global south and we need to remember the reason we need to communicate to consumers these more holistic solutions that deliver on on climate on biodiversity on clean water on better livelihoods in, in rural areas is that that's what we're asking farmers to do. So, you know, regenerative organic farming, agroecology, we're trying to promote that. So we need to reflect that in the market. A couple of things in standing in the way. Um, one is rampant greenwashing, uh, definitely a rise in greenwashing where companies are, you know, trying to rebrand themselves based on small changes in practices, you know, doing small things, claiming them as larger things, and really making a lot of kind of homegrown um, claims regarding uh, regenerative or climate smart or net zero, which are often kind of ill-defined. And I think it can create cynicism out there. Um, so we need to be sure that uh, it, truly transformative farm practices are behind labeling and we need solutions in the global north and the global south. And I think here organic is probably the best solution we have today. Um, it also has this broad infrastructure of, you know, control, inspection, certification that's crucial to making any kind of consumer guarantee. And while it doesn't solve all the problems in the world, it does deliver broadly. Um, so I think, you know, and one last, you know, in terms of the global south um, that several people have addressed, you know, there's really two really exciting developments, I think, there that 
um, with uh, group certification and with uh, participatory guarantee systems, which is kind of a peer guarantee for sustainable practices, which has proven very useful in local markets, regional markets, uh, in guaranteeing more sustainable practices. And that's spread to 77 countries. So that's that there are other solutions than climate labeling and, and organic certification um, out there. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for sharing your experience with us. Um, and last but not least, we've got Michael Clark. So Mike is from the University of Oxford and is a researcher there. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for having me this morning. And thanks, everybody, for the thoughtful comments and insights that you've all made. And we're going to keep hopefully making the next few minutes. But yeah, so I'll take this from more of a data aspect. But very broadly speaking, if you think about equal scores and how to communicate them, you can kind of break it down into like three big bundles. And so the first is how do you, from the beginning, drive impact scores on climate, on biodiversity, on water of individual foods or food products? The second is whether you want to aggregate those climate biodiversity impacts into a single unified score or leave them separate. And then the third is how do you communicate that score to consumers in a way that incentivizes decision making? And so if you look at those three bundles, there are a lot of, as the other panelists have mentioned, there are a bunch of barriers and limitations that we're kind of facing for each of those. I'll focus mostly on that first one. So that's kind of where I'm coming through or coming from, but touch on the second and third very briefly. And so right now with the information that we have, it's we can drive these impact estimates on like what's environmental impact of our yogurt or our Yorkshire pudding or so on. But from the information that we have, we need to make certain assumptions. And so two of those primary assumptions are where is the ingredient being sourced from and how much of each ingredient is in each product. So sometimes we know those, sometimes we don't, but on average, we don't often know that information fully. And so from work that we've been doing, work that other organizations have been doing, it's with those assumptions, we can derive these average impact estimates based on, if you're in the UK, you can say our yogurt is on average sourced from UK or maybe it's sourced from somewhere else. But until we actually have full transparency in that information, those impact estimates will only just be estimates. And so that's kind of one barrier. A, another aspect that actually I'm very happy that Agnes mentioned this, but it's from there, it's how do you have a standardized approach of scoring different products? And so right now we currently have many approaches and they're very, very effective. And so like examples that have been spoken about are organic and reinforced alliance and fair trade. And those have been absolutely brilliant at raising awareness and starting to shift behaviors, both from consumers and corporations and producers. But I really think they need to be supplemented by some other, again, as Agnes was saying, standardized scoring mechanism to say, how do we compare, say, for fair trade bananas against organic coffee, against Rainforest Alliance certified palm oil? It's right now, those comparisons are a little bit difficult to make, and that's kind of the direction that we need to be moving towards. So yeah, on that data point, one of the biggest issues we're facing is really just transparency, both in terms of where commodities are being sourced from for different products, but also in terms of the environmental impact estimates of individual production systems. And so those are two really big obstacles we're facing. Touching briefly on the second point. So again, the second aspect is whether you want to weight and aggregate like the climate impacts and land impacts and water impacts into a single unified score. And so that's an entirely different discussion, but from there it's, do you weight them? If you do weight them, how do you do it? Do you put equal weighting on the different indicators? to weight climate and biodiversity more than land and water because people are more familiar with maybe certain outcomes than others. And so I think that's a discussion that is better suited for a much longer session, to be honest. But I think the important point that needs to be iterated is, again, it's not going to be a single solution in terms of how to weight those metrics in every single country. So it's really going to be context specific. And then the third point, again, so Agnes, you touched on many of the things that I was planning to touch on. So yeah, thank you very much for that. The third point is on how do you communicate these to consumers, to producers, to retailers in a way that incentivizes behavioral change. And so that could be a combination of colors, numbers, letters, symbols. And we have a lot of evidence to draw from, from nutrition labeling, from environmental scoring on home appliances, for instance. But we're only really just exploring that in terms of food systems. And I think we're all on the same journey. And so it's just more going to be an iterative mechanism saying, Here's a label, what do you think about this? Does it work, does it not work? If it doesn't work, go back, revise it, and test it again and again and again until we finally get to something that does work for everybody in the food system. Thank you, that's really insightful. Um, thank you all five for responding to the same question.
Now to jazz it up a little bit, I want to um, give you guys specific questions to address some of your comments. Um, first, we'll go back to Matthew. Matthew, what policies are needed to help SMEs that want to offer sustainable products and educate the consumers? You know, I want to, Dennis, thank you, but I just want to turn this question around. I think what we've seen over the presentations over the last hour is there are lots and lots of labels and information out there. And I think if we want to keep on adding more policies, I don't think that will that will help. I think what is important is the political will to be able to execute and implement them. I mean, I just take the country, just an example of India. I think we have the best in terms of the conceptual framework for, for a lot of this. It's in place. But how do we go about getting not only uh, not only producers, we tend to put the, the entire focus on producers. How do we get customers and other stakeholders, stakeholders involved in making this a win-win scenario for all of them? Paul talked about costs. You know that if, if we don't really just cost becomes a differential so much that most customers in a in a normal response if you talk to them in a survey they will say they are willing to pay a higher price but when it comes up comes out to making the actual uh, the action that needs to take place then there's a hesitation so i think that's that's one uh, critical part the second part is i think um, the state needs to play a much more enabling uh, and facilitation role. I think a lot of this will not just happen by creating policies and laws. How do you create infrastructure that will allow many of these policies to take shape? How do you work uh, with, with producers and processors uh, to create these platforms uh, for this to happen? And I think these two things, if they happen, uh, a lot of change can happen. Thank you. Spot on. Political will is really indeed lacking in some areas, um, more so than others in some countries. Thank you for that, Matthew. Agnes, you're an ex. Um, I'd like to know, you know, don't large companies have big roles to play in shaping the food environment? You know, we've always said that large MNCs have a larger role and more responsibility. What company policies could help shape a sustainable uh, food environment within, you know, internally? Yes, uh, for sure, a company has a significant role to play in shaping the food environment uh, to what a more sustainable offer. I uh, just wanted to remind that sustainability for, for food is really not on passing only uh, environmental and social aspects, but also health aspects. And I think it's very important to consider that because it makes the equation a bit more complex. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of company levels, uh, for sure, the, the first level we have is uh, the product offer that we put on the market. And uh, I think the first point I think we should uh, pay attention to is to be able to provide products which are part of the uh, food categories recommended by the food based dietary guidelines, and specifically those who have been revised to integrate sustainability dimension in them. So first category products. Uh, second point is about the, the quality of the product we put on the market, specifically nutritional quality but also where it's coming from in terms of uh, agricultural practices, what kind of uh, pack we have used, is it recyclable or not? Do we have ensure fair revenue for the farmers, etc.? And uh, without forgetting that what drives the purchase before all is taste, price and convenience. So that, that's a big equation that we need to, uh, to, uh, to agree to, to, to reach. Second uh, level we have is also the, the, the brands. And more and more we see that brand purpose, um, pur um, uh, purpose brand, uh, purpose driven brands, sorry, are now more and more successful. And uh, we, we know that uh, the ones who are integrating sustainability in their purpose is now uh, getting uh, more and more brand and more and more success to our consumers who are now uh, ready to pay a little bit more for this kind of product. Uh, of course, we talk a lot about labeling. Uh, so we know now we have a lot of experience regarding nutritional labeling. So now it's really time to go to uh, an environmental labeling. And we see many experience in the Europe zone at the moment. And then also to social labeling. And it's exactly the, uh, the, the political route that the European Commission wants to, to go through for the, in the coming years is to really combine these uh, different aspects together 
uh, to um, uh, maybe create in, 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 in the future a, a mandatory uh, sustainable leveling uh, approach. Um, during the conversation before, we also mentioned sampling, but I would add also promotion. I think um, manufacturers and retailers can play together to uh, develop some uh, specific programs promoting more sustainable uh, products. And we know that uh, under the Consumer Goods Forum today, the, what we call the Health and Wellness Coalition, there is a lot of trials which are currently uh, running uh, in different countries to see how by combining the efforts of retailers and manufacturers, we can uh, identify good practices. And the good news is that the result of these kind of trials, uh, which are um, developed in collaboration between academics, retailers, manufacturers, NGOs, consumer associations, etc., now become public. Um, so it, it's uh, we do have more and more knowledge on that, thanks to this kind of, of experimentation. Um, just for, to give you a ex concrete example, in Belgium, uh, the retailer Harold de Leist now is using Nutri-Score uh, to uh, promote the A and B, the best products, and uh, it's, it's used in their loyalty programs. They provide the uh, incentives uh, to buy this kind of products. So this kind of thing can become reality. Thank you. Um, Thank you for your time and um, um, feedback. Now we're moving quickly over to Kamana from Sewa. What policies would support consumers in playing the desired role that we have thought out for them? of driving sustainable demand. Like how can policies really protect consumer choices? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, okay. Since I will elaborate this on my own opinion. So since uh, from 2020, I have been a, the member of Consumer International and I have gone through uh, lots of policies and laws which are uh, written in the uh, government of Nepal book. Uh, so uh, going through that book, the policies are written in book, but they are not into action or implementation. So it's not uh, really uh, we have to make uh, certain policy so if we implement and if you take that policy into action it will definitely work so there are some kinds of um not to elaborate so there is not a regular mechanism uh, that is by the uh, government or who are on the consumer side so standard for consumer friendly and that is the main problem and why trials are not taken place, so it, it may be uh, put into the policies so that we can uh, know the justified uh, consumers' uh, quality test and everything. And we are on the uh, technology uh, and digitalization world, but we cannot give the product information quickly to the consumers. So it can be included in the policy so that we can overcome uh, about the challenge of the uh, sustainable food consumption. And lastly, we have to fulfill the consumer commitment regarding the uh, pro product information so that uh, we can uh, directly or indirectly approach to the consumer uh, challenges and we can overtook their challenge and we can just include that thing in the policy. And if we implement the written policy into action, it will definitely work. Thank you, Kamana. Um, Paul, we've got one for you with regard to Organic Denmark. How did Organic Denmark contribute to Denmark's policies and action plans to expand organic production and consumption? What was the key? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely clear that um, consumers and labels can't do it on their own. Um, getting Denmark to where 80% of all consumers are buying organic food every week and where we have organic market shares for many basic products of 30 to 50%. Some conventional products like bananas and others are actually being phased out. Getting there required several different factors. Um, we work for very strong national and local policies um, to drive organic uh, conversion on farming, um, uh, innovation, market development, consumer awareness, public procurement, because the public sector is also a purchaser of food. Um, and these policy options, and actually policy options from all around the world, iPhone has brought into a policy toolbox is super handy for, for people to use. 
Another thing we did was that we created a strong NGO as a catalyst for change that can build the partnerships. We brought the sector together, farmers, food companies, a whole supply chain, um, and then um, in order to be a catalyst for, for all that needed to happen. A third lesson is that the government actually invested in the, in the organic NGO, Organic Denmark, but also other NGOs that were important to driving change. Um, this is missing actually in most countries. Um, and then we've collaborated intensively. Uh, we've worked to build a platform of, uh, of uh, allies in organizations for consumers, for animal welfare, labor unions, not least, um, climate, environment, and working with all 11 political parties in our parliament to create a positive policy environment for uh, organics. And another key area with partnerships is our work with retailers who have that contact surface to all consumers. So we've helped them to broaden their product assortments, make products more visual, you know, visible in the stores, position them the well, and just communicate the why of organic just much better to, to consumers. And that last piece is also important that the government has invested in consumer awareness, um, you know, with simple, uh, positive messaging on organics, um, and also we put a lot of weight on experience that people don't just need information, they need to actually be out on organic farms. So we actually have 5% of the population every year physically on an organic farm. So these different efforts, you know, with policy, market actors, and the organic sector itself has kind of made this fortuitous upward going spiral where everyone's motivating everyone and, and motivating to additional actions for uh, food systems change. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, rookie mistake. I had my mic muted. Um, now moving on to Mike. Mike, we've got one for you. It is usually said that price is the best driver of behavior change because, you know, the economics have spelled it all out. What complementary policies do you believe are required to make consumer information work then, aside from just price? How do we integrate the, uh, the true value of food, internalizing both social and environmental components? Yeah, thank you. So that's a really big question to answer in a minute, but I'll do what I can. The, yeah, so I think from the starting point, from a broad perspective, we need to make these healthy and nutrition sustainable choices the easy choice. And so one that we all think about is the price so make cheap foods, one that are also nutritious and sustainable. If you do focus specifically on price, I'll take segue to other mechanisms, but if you focus on price, there's evidence from model-based assessments and empirical assessments that making nutritious foods cheaper and sustainable foods cheaper does shift behavior towards them, but maybe not at the scale that we want. So if you look at other mechanisms, some of these have been discussed by the other panelists. You can change the food environment and so in that case, it's both nudges making the products that are nutritious, more sustainable, more accessible in the grocery stores and canteens and retail environments. That's quite effective. A, another behavioral mechanism too, and this could be policy, it could be otherwise, is having certain choices that say catering organizations or restaurants provide. And so in that case, well, from experiments that we've done, it's the biggest leverage in canteens to shift the consumer behavior is not providing information on environmental impacts of food products, but shifting the meals that are being provided in the canteens themselves. And so from that perspective, it's more shifting availability of products. So it isn't saying remove anything entirely from the market, but it's maybe just making things a little bit more plant forward or low impact forward than what they are right now. So yeah, a lot of options. We don't really fully know what they are because we haven't tested them fully. And the important point is that they're probably going to be contact specific because what people do in the UK is going to be very different from what people do in Denmark. It's going to be very different from what people do in Nepal. So it's, again, an iterative process to figure out what works and what doesn't. Yeah, that's a trial and error to, to, to try out for sure. Um, we're going to invite both Joshua Bishop and Victoria back to the screen to join us for the Q&A session from the audiences. Oh, we've got a couple that's already been identified. Welcome back. To both our speakers. Thank you for joining us again and for staying on the line. Um, the first one goes to Josh, actually. Josh, we'll start with you. Um, we've got a question from the audience that is asking, let me find it here. In your idea, communications and interactions in social media can be 
what no sorry in your opinion how can communications and interactions on social media begin to look like the social norm it's it's a, a fascinating question because of course um Social media is relatively new. It's it's been around uh, you know a, a decade or two, and uh, we we all carry around these little devices that uh, bombard us with messages from uh, our networks. Um, some of us are on Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram or TikTok or whatever it may be, um, and those platforms we know do influence people's um, decisions. Um, and their preferences. So, for example, uh, here in Australia, you go into a restaurant, uh, even the the low price restaurants, and you'll see people gathering around, taking photographs of the food they're eating, and then sharing that with their network. Right? Uh, they Instagram it. Um, and I think if if so, we need to figure out how do we use those platforms more actively, more uh, uh, more consciously to influence the way food is talked about the way food is presented can you know we're familiar with influencers on social media who are sometimes tapped by big retail companies or big brands to promote their products well could we do that with, with sustainable food and obviously it needs to be tailored to different markets every consumer is different every consumer is unique um, and obviously as as uh, Matthew and others have pointed out you can't, you know, what you do in, in the UK or in the US or in Germany is not necessarily going to work in Nepal or India or uh, other countries in the global south. So we, we need uh, communication strategies that are tailored to different markets and different segments within markets, but that really leverage the, these new technologies, new platforms and communication methods that we have. I think we've We've hardly begun to do that, and there's huge potential. We've done an awful lot on the supply side of, of food sustainability. I think there's still lots more to do on the demand side. So that's where I look for uh, the innovation, and uh, it's quite exciting. Yeah, social media seems to be the final frontier, isn't it, for, for, for us these days? Um, thanks, Josh. I, I'm moving on to a question that I would like to pose to both Matthew and Kamala, Matthew first and then Kamala, which is about the global south. So um, a couple of us have been discussing and we'd like to know your opinion. What do you think could be a successful strategy to address these issues in the global south? As we know, the data and information that we've gathered has predominantly been from the global north. Um, and you've raised some very interesting points there, Matthew. Let's expand a little bit on your thought process and let us know what you think might work. Yeah, so as I mentioned, Denise, that you know, a lot of the policies are already in, in place, but where it falls down is in the execution or the implementation of many of these policies. And I think a critical part of this is that though we have the framework in place, we try one approach uh, as the solution. And that cannot be an answer. What works in one part of our country uh, will not work in another part of the country. That's one. In approaches, when I say approaches also, I mean that when we look, most of the time we look at third party certification as the only answer. Yeah. But we have many other ways of being able to address that, whether it is through participatory guarantee systems, whether it is through uh, self declarations, and many of these will work in local contexts. We cannot have what works in an urban area cannot be transported and put down into a rural area. But in a rural area, a lot of times trust um, is the biggest uh, foundation we can build uh, build our structures on. Uh, but we tend to to take trust out of the equation, put either documentation or third parties into into the into the picture, and that's not the answer. Uh, literacy. Um, um, writing uh, skills, all of this becomes a huge problem when, when you try and answer these, uh, these, these issues. And so for me, it is important that we tend to localize many of the solutions. We should localize many of the solutions, leave, leave it to certain areas or to certain um, uh, departments or governments to be able to frame things which are more contextual. And that will be the only answer. I mean, I'm just giving an example of honey, 
we have uh, we have copied and pasted an entire regulation which works in the global north to a global south scenario without taking to, into into context what works here, what are the species here, what are the geographies here, and all of that. We have not understood that. And when you work, try and work this with the government, it becomes a difficult task. So we need governments to be able to understand that and come up with local contextual solutions. Thanks, Bentu. Kamana, what about you? What do you think the global self means? Uh, basically, a uh, consumer and uh, have knowledge about the products, and uh, they they must be uh, in, uh, aware about the products they are using. Uh, but uh, talking about strategy, as we are in global world, uh, we are not getting the much more information about the uh, food products which we are using in our day to day life. So uh, people uh, will go to the shop, any consumer will go to the shop and they will buy the things randomly without uh, knowing the manufacture date and uh, uh, expiry date. So uh, the people uh, who are uh, uh, selling the products, they are very clever that they have erased and they will sell the same product which has already expired and they will uh, sell that the, uh, with uh, different it and different so first and foremost, we have aware about the consumer about their rights and their policies from the ground level so that we haven't been aware about the uh, food policies of uh, consumer rights and literacy so we have to go from the uh, ground level to enrich the uh, the things uh, 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 globally and we have to uh, do it from the local level ground level and we have to start it from our school uh, the advocacy should be given to the uh, students and children so that they will learn the many things and they we can get the uh, uh, challenges overcome over it i think fantastic so provide them the tools to be able to make the right decisions um Got another shared question. This is for Victoria and Mike. I'll start with Victoria and then we'll move on to Mike. How can we balance the levels of importance placed on the environmental and the social issue alongside the importance already placed on the nutritional issues? Thanks, Denise. Um, I think, well, we've done a lot of consultation around this as well when developing the methodology uh, uh, because there's more indicators or there's more thematic topics in a environment and social, for example, versus nutrition. Every, every response was each of those three items is equally important. If we really want to tackle food systems uh, as, as a systemic issue and, and, and durable for long, long term, we need to address them equally. Uh, however, from, from the assessment that we've made, we see that the nutritional element is the weakest link. Uh, that's what companies are performing the weakest. It's the, it's the lowest level of awareness and it's the least where, where action is happening. So it would uh, be natural that that gets a bit of a, a push to, to also become more uh, aware for consumers as well. And I think there is also differentiation needed in, in any kind of local uh, and other settings where you are uh, faced with, with, uh, with a demographic or with populations who, um, uh, yeah, um, who are more vulnerable and where the nutritional element should have to prevail. So, so I think from global policies and from global strategies, definitely an equal way, but given uh, local context into consideration. Yeah, so much much left to, to, to share and educate among consumers as well. Mike, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, that was a brilliant answer. So I was going to say the same thing. It's I think we're thinking about this push towards a single unified label. And realistically, it's we all make decisions on environment, nutrition, and social aspects of food in different ways. And so, yeah, I personally don't see a way, a reason to integrate them because, again, it's they're all important in different ways. There are different types of information, and different individuals, different places respond to environment in different ways or nutrition in different ways. So, it's I really think having them separate is a good way forward. Also, kind of following on from what Victoria is saying, it's we found the same evidence in terms of consumers responding least to nutrition information than they do to environmental or social information. And so it doesn't mean that nutrition is any less important because there are knock-on implications of people eating less nutritious food to healthcare systems or the economy and so on. But it just, it's really interesting is that just 
kind of gets back to the communication mechanism saying, how do you communicate nutrition in an effective way while also communicating environmental impacts in an effective way while also communicating the social impacts in an effective way. And again, that's really going to be context specific because we all queue on different types of information. Yeah, and, and of course, the communication approaches are vastly different because people react to the information very differently in the digestion of that information. Uh, we've got some more questions coming through, but let me shift the focus to Agnes and um, Paul. So this one's about greenwashing, fun one. So what do you think? We'll start with, uh, with Agnes first. What policy and commercial trends have you seen that are just simply dead ends that don't work, but we still continue doing it? I think one of the, it's not really greenwashing, but something that we, we see more and more and that it is really providing an unreliable picture of environmental impact of products is uh, to talk about a carbon footprint of, uh, of a product. Um, there is uh, some brands who are now trying to want to, to start to be more transparent about the, the carbon footprint of their products. But we all know that carbon footprint is just one aspect of the environmental impact. And uh, it could be really misleading for consumers to buy a product which is presented as low, uh, with a low carbon footprint, but probably have a high water footprint or high uh, biodiversity footprint. So uh, I think it's really crucial to really be able to encompass the full scope of uh, environmental indicator that we have today to really reflect the true impact, environmental impact of product that uh, they have in reality. And um, in terms, let's say, of, of global approach of a company, uh, what's important is beyond products, it's also to, um, to have companies defining some global targets uh, at corporate level within this, their, their global policy. As an example, uh, being committed to, uh, uh, to reach the 1.5 uh, degree uh, increase of, of climate change um, and to put in place some very robust uh, measurements and monitoring and reporting schemes so that they are fully responsible for their full uh, operation, including scope three. I mean, not only the operation, and uh, but also including the, the production, uh, the farming part of their, of their activities. Great, then Paul, over to you. What do you think about the trend? Yeah, I think uh, Alice makes some really good points. Um, at net zero, I think, is one dead end. Um, that's been discredited now, particularly where, as Arnas mentions, that companies have been talking about their own operations, their own little piece of the supply chain, scope, scope uh, two and three, but, but not uh, scope one, two, but not scope three. They're suppliers, where in agriculture and food, we're talking about 75 to 95 percent of all climate emissions, for example, come from that stage. So by leaving that out, it's complete greenwashing. Um, so that, I think, has been discredited. We need policies at national levels and, uh, and regional levels to, uh, to set ground rules for that. We've made a lot of recommendations here in Denmark. I think some of these things are ending up in court. That's certainly the case in the Netherlands. We've also seen it in food now with some serious, a serious court case in Denmark regarding uh, climate-controlled uh, pork. Um, and then I think the whole regenerative issue, um, I hope, doesn't become a dead end, but it risks that because um, just too many companies, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to see what is essentially about, you know, practices and principles that bring more life to the soil and, and, uh, and greater biodiversity being used um, in greenwashing where very few practices are changing. So I think what we'll see is Kind of emerging so we don't have this ill-defined regenerative but i think we'll see things like the regenerative organic alliance and regenerative organic certification that's emerging where it builds on a solid foundation of organic and then adds additional regenerative practices um, so and that's also a policy dead end by the way there's so many countries now trying to support farmers regenerative practices which basically is not changing much on the farms at all very interesting. Just maybe one more one to, to add to that, and I fully agree with what has been said, that we really need to get some policy regulation at national or regional level to really level the playing field and to really uh, be able to, to create some uh, fair uh, condition, market conditions, and also to uh, allow the, the free market, specifically in Europe. And this kind of policy and regulation should be also the result of a multi-stakeholder approach 
in order to really get uh, the full scope of the issues, the challenges, the barriers, and, and the possible solutions, and to be really be pragmatical and be uh, become a, a, a real solution. Thank you, Agnes. Um, there's one very interesting conversation that's going on, and it's it's a question posed by Nathan King. Thank you, Nathan. He wants to know whether there are any realistic alternatives to reducing meat consumption. If not, how can we make that happen in the global West where everyone's used to cheap, plentiful meat? I'll direct this question to Paul and Mike. Um, Paul, back to you again. Yeah, there's so much we can do to bring a better balance to our food production and consumption so it's less based on animal-based production. Um, one thing is we subsidize massively. Um, in Denmark, it's 80% of the area that's subsidized, of farm area, is going to feed to animals. This is, a, this is a subsidy to meat and dairy production. We could eliminate those subsidies and only subsidize crops grown directly for human consumption or change the balance within those subsidies. That would change agriculture overnight. Um, and then on the sort of the behavior side, on the consumer side, I really like what Denmark and some other countries have done now, building in, you know, kind of climate nutrition pyramid instead of just a nutrition pyramid. And actually, it's a lot of the same things. It's a, it's a lot less meat based, more plants, just shifting the balance on the plate, just as we want to shift the balance on the farms so that our farms also look different. And I think we can also use the last thing, um, public procurement. Um, in Denmark, from the beginning in the 90s, our conversion to organic in public kitchens, schools, hospitals, military barracks, has not just been about the shift to organic from conventional, but also a full sustainability package where we've reduced the amount of meat, reduced waste, bought products in season. And that's actually paid for the organic premium, but it's also really improved the climate uh, 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 balance in the food. And then it's given people this positive experience of meals with less meat and just more greens. Fantastic. So food over feed and redraw the traditional food pyramid. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Mike, what do you think? Yeah. So in short, if you take the look at the evidence base that's currently out there, there's quite a bit of suggestion and indication that we need to do both less and better. And so if you look at it from a global scale, and granted not everything's a global scale, but if you look at it from a global scale, if you don't do less and you don't do better at the same point, we're going to miss the climate and biodiversity targets relatively soon. So it's you kind of have to attack this issue from both ends. But the really important thing to note is that the direction of change, both in terms of eating less but also producing better, is going to be very different in different countries. And so in locations that have a history of high meat consumption, so the UK, Australia, Argentina, other countries, it's going to be eating a lot less. In some countries that don't eat so much meat right now, it may be eating more for nutrition, health, and social perspectives. So it's global scale, it's eat less and better to meet these targets. Some nationally, it could be very different directions depending on what people are currently eating. A little bit like what we're encouraging with the planet diets instead of just a diet that's um, organic or healthy. So it's about what makes sense. I've got one last question, and it's an interesting one. It brings us back to the final frontier. Um, it's for Josh. The start and the end of the presentation goes back to you, Josh. Moha wants to know how we can ensure that the sustainability claims to consumers are authentic. She mentions the use of blockchain. What do you think? So thanks for that, Denise. I think blockchain can be part of the answer, not the whole answer. Um, we, we have lots of years of experience of building credible standards and certification schemes. and. Third-party verification is, is critical. Uh, Multi-stakeholder governance is, is critical. Um, uh, you know, public disclosure of performance uh, and of audit results is critical. So there's a, a range of things that are not high tech, but yes, blockchain can be part of that. And digital technology more generally can be part of that. Um, reducing the costs of verification and blockchain technology, as we know, can increase the, the trustworthiness of data because it's, it's very difficult to, um, to manipulate and falsify. It has, uh, it has its own um, complications. Um, it, uh, blockchain very often is extremely energy intensive, so that's a problem we need to, to resolve. Um, but uh, I think there are some lots of promising opportunities, as I say, with digital technology, not just blockchain, but also remote sensing, um, low-cost sensors, 
filters um, that you can use um, at all stages of production and in supply chains. Just for your information, a little plug, um, WWF and Boston Consulting Group set up a, a company called OpenSC, which stands for Open Supply Chain, which is in investigating some of these opportunities across uh, many different countries and commodities. So not the only ones, um, uh, lots of people in, in this space now doing some really fascinating work. Thanks, Josh. Very succinct and very good. Um, we earlier, midway through the session, we conducted a poll with three questions. I thank you all for participating in that poll. I would like to read out a couple of um, the top line responses that have come up. So the first question we asked was, what's the biggest challenge you think is required to leverage product sustainability information for sustainable food consumption? 33% of you said that consumers give more priority to other food attributes such as taste, price, safety, and as a than sustainability. We have since concluded in the past, past hour or so that this is indeed true. We have data that provides uh, proof that this is happening. And we also have been able to see that there are new incentives and initiatives that are taking place to change that. The second question is, which of the following is most critical to increase effectiveness and credibility of sustainability information? There were two top responses. Um, the first one is that they, we believe mandatory corporate responsibility reporting and food labeling is important. And the second is regulation of food markets to ensure better alignment with the SDGs. So again, we go back to policies of large businesses and governments. And the final question was what you thought the most crucial next step is for consumer information to enable a more sustainable food system. Uh, a whopping over 25% of you thought that mandatory environmental labeling, aka eco score or eco label, would actually make a huge difference. So, um, a very interesting conversation brings to mind one of those um, articles that I read before that when a problem is perceived to be far too too hard to address by an individual or by small actions, they usually defer to larger systemic changes to help them achieve that. Um, and this clearly shows us that the problem is across the board, it's for all of us. Let me wrap up a couple of other components. Um, so obviously shifting demand for food towards more sustainable consumption is increasingly recognized as necessary. Uh, for, for various amount of reasons. Growing evidence also reveals that both human health and environment and the environment could benefit and would benefit from the adoption of more sustainable diets. Coupled with that, um, the session today further reinforces the fact that there are significant potential and needs to implement more and improve consumer sustainability information across the board. Um, while there are already a range of complementary interventions that, that help foster improve consumer information, we need to do more. We need to develop more interventions by adopting holistic approaches. Um, and again, this is something that's been advocated by the UN Food Systems Summit. Um, these, these complementary measures should rely on, again, collaboration because not one person can do everything. We need bolder actions to deliver bolder change that's required. Businesses in particular, uh, we all agree, need to do more to contribute urgently to our common goals stated in the Paris Agreement, IEG targets, the 2030 agenda. Equally, we know policy makers need to support wide-scale systemic change that really helps drive actions by all stakeholders. Genuinely, I think uh, to summarize, there is a part for everyone to play. Uh, we need to start working with retailers at a more strategic level to expand sustainable food product lines, present more products in stores that encourage, you know, that encourage us to communicate the why sustainability is important to consumers, how sustainability is going to impact their life at the end of the day. Um, it can also include leveraging pre-competitive, multi-actor, collaborative mechanisms to entice retailers to make these commitments. And of course, to attract a growing consumer base as, as, they, as they move along. So in conclusion, we're at the top of the hour. This session really reinforces the important messages to businesses and policymakers on the need to collaborate through multi-stakeholder efforts such as the One Planet Network and other holistic approaches to sustainable consumption and production to urgently achieve the agendas that we have. The next conference uh, will continue at 2 p.m. CST with the session Building the Business Case for Nature-Friendly Consumption how businesses scale up consumer information and biodiversity and ecosystem services and thrive. So with that, I wish you all and my and the panelists as well. Thank you for joining us and uh, have a very productive day. Do have a nice day.